There has to be some common sense. Yes, sir, they have the car stopped in town and Grant's microphone. We still don't know who pulled the trigger. everyone and welcome to police off the cuff real crime stories i'm your host retired nypd sergeant bill cannon and with me today retired nypd detective and straight out of brooklyn phil grimaldi how are you doing today phil i'm doing good billy just uh, a little depressed over this case and the latest developments but i'm doing okay how you doing bill good you know something uh so much has happened in 24 hours all the news that we have to report now unfortunately is not good news. Uh, we all know that uh, Eliza was running at 0430 hours on Friday, where she was accosted by a man in a black SUV. What we're learning now is that uh, she received very severe physical injuries during this attack, as she fought for her life as he forced her inside the car. On the scene, she left her cell phone and her water bottle. And luckily, this perpetrator left his champion sandals on the scene, which the FBI, ATF, the local police, they were able to lift DNA and identify the perpetrator. And that's how the, the arrest was made, which is unbelievable police work. Fantastic. Which led them to him. They led them to the vehicle. They got the vehicle back. They arrested him. He's not talking, but they released more about the encounter. And of course, as you know, and I know, uh, it's not good news. Absolutely, Billy. Very sad. Um, from what we know about this case, obviously, what we talked about yesterday, things took a very different spin. It looks like this was a stranger attack. Uh, according to witness reports and the video, uh, it appears that he ran up on her. Uh, he assaulted her and he forced her into the vehicle. Um, the exact wording in the uh, in the document that was provided in the arrest uh, uh, documents, victim suffered ser uh, serious and severe injuries, uh, which also led them to believe that there was blood evidence also in the vehicle, which uh, at 8.30 Friday morning, he was seen cleaning out the vehicle and also washing his clothes. That's about a few hours after the uh, attack takes place. Uh, the video surveillance also showed that uh, they make mention of damage to the uh, I believe it was the rear tail tail light. Uh, I don't know if during the course of the assault, uh, if he, you know, thrust her body against that uh, tail light and it caused it to break. Um, he did leave the uh, champion slippers that you talked about. I can't compliment FBI, TBI, local law enforcement, ATF, every uh, law enforcement agency that was involved in this that with such a quick response to getting the DNA lifted from the sandals, which were actually found by a person riding a bike. I think his name was uh, Miles Fortis. He turned it into the family and then uh, the police were able to recover the DNA off of it. Uh, it was put into the database. Uh, as we all know, someone that's convicted of a felony of uh, this type, uh, he was convicted of uh, uh, forcing forcible kidnapping and robbery. Uh, so his DNA was in the database. They were able to make a quick match on it and uh, arrest them. They were also able to recover. Uh, this is very important. Video surveillance of him wearing champion slippers earlier on Friday, I believe it was. Or, I'm sorry, earlier on Thursday. It was sometime earlier where he was wearing these champion slippers before the attack. That's very important. And then also they have his cell phone pinging in and around the area of where the attack took, took place. So uh, basically, Bill, before you and I went on the air, we said they got this guy, they got him good for whatever is going to be, uh, you know, leveled against him going forward. It sounds like a very good case against him. That's on the screen. You see his name is Cleota Abstin, 38 years old. He just got out of prison in 2020. And guess for what? He did a kidnapping 20 years ago. He did 20 years for a kidnapping. Kidnapped at some attorney, threw him in the trunk of a car, forced him to take money out of his bank account. He has also a very extensive juvenile record for violent crimes and robbery. So we're very concerned with this, obviously. 
uh, because he's. So a let me make a point about about what you were just talking about. I don't mean to cut you off, but he was sentenced in that case you were just uh, referencing. He was sentenced to twenty four years and eleven years. It appears that he served his sentences consecutively instead of, uh, I'm sorry, concurrently instead of consecutively. If the judge had uh, said, you know, uh, serve the sentences consecutively, he'd have to serve one and then the other. It's also possible that he was paroled on the first charge and they were consecutive, but uh, he should not have been on the street is the bottom line. 24 and 11 years on on, uh, those charges. I just hope that it wasn't concurrent, uh, but Either way, this this scumbag should not have been on the street to attack this young woman. It's terrible. It's very, you know, very folks. Bad. We don't we don't know if in fact um, this was a random attack. Had he been targeting her specifically, we don't know any of those things. It seems like, based on the fact after when they arrested him, he probably uh, either invoked counsel or just refused to speak at all. Because right now we don't know where Eliza is. And he, if they were counting on this guy to tell us, he's obviously not going to do that. Uh, so that, that's such a tragedy. And so law enforcement is going to have to find Eliza uh, on their own. And, uh, you know, hopefully the community, tips from the community, people that saw something, again, if you see something, say something. And so, you know, 24 hours ago, 30 hours ago, we were totally wrong. We were thinking that potentially this could be a targeted, this could be a inside job. It, it doesn't look that way. It looks like it may have been a random attack. It may have been. We don't know. But it, 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 we said that one of the worst things can ever happen to anyone is that they're forced inside a vehicle. Everything that happens after that is bad. Listen, Bill, uh, we were uh, in a different direction yesterday when we reported on this case, but we were going based on the facts that were presented to us. When you see the police walking out of the victim's home with the bags of evidence, the, the laptop, and then they even took a vehicle into uh, custody to inventory it and perhaps uh, examine it for crime scene evidence, that's what led us in that direction. The fact that she comes from a wealthy family, which made her a prime target for a kidnapping and ransom. So we were going in that direction. And it looks now that, like you said, Bill, this may have been, she may have been randomly chosen as a victim. Perhaps he saw her previously on her jog and staked her out, uh, saw that her pad, what her pattern was of running, whatever the case may be. He, uh, according to witness statements and the video, he ran up on her. So he sounds like maybe he, he parked the vehicle and then either walked back, maybe hidden some behind something. And then when she passed him, he runs out, he grabs her and the struggle ensues. Bill, you made that point yesterday, and I think that's so, so important. Do not allow, if you're attacked, do not allow yourself to be taken to a second location. Wherever you are when the attack takes place, if there's someone trying to get you into a car or drag you into a house, you need to fight for your life because nothing good is going to come out of being removed from one location to another location. Obviously, uh, bad intentions uh, are, are at play when someone attacks you, but Bill, one quick thing about uh, the search for her. I'm sure they, they did say that his phone pinged at the location. So they have a thing called cellular triangulation. Cellular triangulation will give locations of where his phone traveled based on hitting different cell towers. So with that, they'll look for areas where he could have possibly, uh, if she was killed and dumped, and I hate to even say that, but I, I think the realization is coming forward that you know, the chances of her being alive are not good. And I hate to even go there and, and respect for the family. Please don't take it the wrong way. But I think uh, from our experience, uh, the chances of her being found are not that great. So they're all going to triangulate the phone. They're going to look where the phone traveled to. Uh, it appears he was back at his house cleaning the vehicle out at like 8.30 in the morning. So it's not a lot of time. And that's how they're going to probably focus their search. Obviously, tips from the public are going to be very, very important. Anyone saw that vehicle in and around uh, specific areas in that area, in Memphis, Tennessee, call it into the police that may help in the uh, search and recovery of, uh, of Eliza. Folks, in Tennessee, they have a charge called especially aggravated kidnapping. And one of the ways is to display a deadly weapon or the victims under 13, or committed to hold the victim for a ransom or a reward, or committed to use the victim as a shield or a hostage, or where the victim suffers serious bodily injury. 
So I think they know just based on the video that she sustained very serious bodily injury. So he was being charged with, I never heard of this charge in New York, they don't have it, especially aggravated kidnapping. Just a horrible, I mean, this guy he should not He was also charged with that the first time around, I think, too, Billy. I read that uh, he was charged with the especially, especially, uh, what was the aggravated category? Aggravated kidnapping, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he he was charged with that, I guess, because of the, the force getting into the trunk of the car with that attorney that was kidnapped, so... Again. Look, I, I don't doubt that she fought for her life. Oh, and I'm sure of it. He, she fought real hard. She's in good shape. But this guy knew what he was going to do. He may have hit her with something. We don't know. But he was able to force her in the car, and she sustained a very serious physical injury. So, again, as we said, she fought very hard. One of the other things that's concerning to me is that he stayed on the scene for four minutes after the attack. I mean... What was that all about? Yeah, that's very, very uh, disturbing. Uh, obviously, it seems like she did put up a fight, like you said, Bill. And, uh, you know, he probably overpowered her or he enlisted uh, some type of uh, maybe a stun gun or something like that to incapacitate her. But it sounds like there was a violent struggle based on what you read in the in the affidavit of, of the charges. So, again, he gets her into the vehicle. It says that he remained in the parking lot for an extended period of time, four minutes, they say. So in that four minutes, what was going on in the car? God only knows. Uh, it's just very, very odd, the whole situation. And uh, it's really heart-wrenching. And, and it troubles me and it pains me to even, you know, speak about uh, – what could have gone on, what we think went on. It's just a, a real terrible case. You look at this woman, uh, you know, a vibrant young woman with two young children and uh, a husband comes from a, a nice family, it seems like. And uh, it's just really, uh, it's it's a terrible case, terrible case. Major developments overnight in the search for a missing school teacher in Tennessee. Police now say they found the car that they believe was involved in this kidnapping, and they've also made an arrest. ABC's Mola Lange has the latest from Memphis. Mola, good morning. Good morning, Trevor. Yeah, finding that vehicle appears to have been the key to finding a suspect and making an arrest. A 38-year-old man, Cleotha Abstin, has now been charged with aggravated kidnapping. Still, Eliza Fletcher, who police say was abducted right back here on this Memphis road behind me, she remains missing this morning. This morning, a breakthrough in the search for Memphis mom Eliza Fletcher. Police said they found the vehicle of interest and detained the man who was inside it. Eliza, nowhere to be found. It's now been a number of hours since they detained an individual that was in the car allegedly used in this abduction. I have real concerns about her well-being because it's just been too long. More than anything, we want to see Liza returned home safely. Her family pleading for someone to come forward, offering a $50,000 reward. We believe someone knows what happened and can help. ABC affiliate WATN confirming Fletcher is the granddaughter of a prominent businessman and philanthropist and the niece of the city's chief legal officer. Possible abduction earlier today for Ms. Liz Fletcher. The 34-year-old kindergarten teacher reported missing Friday after she did not return from an early morning run. Police saying a dark SUV approached her around 4.30 a.m. and forced her inside the car. Police seen collecting a laptop and garden shears while at her home Friday. Also, towing a white wagoneer parked out front. Authorities saying they found her water bottle and cell phone near where she was reportedly abducted. Our whole church deeply loves the Fletcher family. Her church holding a vigil for Eliza. We are deeply pained and sorrowed by what's going on, and we're praying for her safe return. A second person not currently believed to be connected to the abduction has also been arrested. Now, this investigation is ongoing, Janae. Multiple agencies are involved, including the FBI. So, so many questions, Mola. Thank you. You know, it's uh, we spoke about it uh, yesterday, and I believe now, other than the fact that he was out there driving around, was he was he cruising for a victim at 4.30 in the morning? The car was not his. The car belonged to some, some woman with who he was staying with. And, you know, that's frightening. Was he out there trolling the city for a victim and this is very disturbing and I, I don't want to predict what he was doing or what happened but you know it's this is not good this is not a good scenario what occurred 
Yeah, Billy, there was, uh, they talked about that other arrest. It sounds like there was another person who wasn't involved in this particular investigation, but they found with drugs and a, and a weapon and they arrested that person. Uh, that happens when you're conducting investigation and you stumble upon uh, some criminal activity and arrest is made. However, it's not related to the investigation that you're working on. But, you know, Bill, uh, even though uh, we had a difference of opinion with regard to what's actually taking place today. We didn't think it, it seemed like it was a random attack. It seemed like it was more targeted. What we would do as investigators in the initial stages, we would go down those, uh, those, you know, avenues or those investigative, uh, you know, directions to eliminate too. So I, I said that yesterday, we would, you know, try to find out if there's anybody that wanted to harm our, or anyone that had, uh, you know, issues, we would look into see if there was domestic violence. Those are courses of action that you would take normally in investigation, not only to investigate it to see if you, you know, you can develop information or, or lead into that that uh, direction, but you also would like to eliminate that from the, uh, you know, take that out of the investigation. So that's why uh, our instincts went in that direction. Because that's the first thing you look at. You always look at the husband. You always look at family. You always look to see what's going on in the person's background at the time. So that way, if there is some conflict going on, then you can go in that direction. Apparently, as we said earlier, it doesn't look like it looks like she was targeted by this predator, this this scumbag that I called him earlier. And I, I can't, I just, it, it's infuriating even to look at his picture. It's just terrible. You know, the scariest thing with this is that it does look like a random attack right now that he was out there looking for a victim, driving around in a vehicle that wasn't even his. He just uh, was let out of in 2020, where he did 20 years. He's basically a career criminal, is what he is. And um, when he was apprehended, he did not cooperate. He obviously, he didn't, uh, he didn't talk, he didn't tell anything. And that's disturbing, you know, because he knows he knows where Eliza is, and it's just despicable that, you know, he won't talk. Now the game's up, dude. You're going to prison for life. This is a picture of the car, and I think in the apprehension, uh, I read somewhere, and it was unverified, that the ATF vehicle slammed into the side of this car in order to stop him. He was probably trying to run, uh, and they slammed into it, and they were able to apprehend him. They wouldn't put out where they actually apprehended the vehicle, where they apprehended him, where it was. But there's some um, there's some information on uh, social media. But I'm not going to just put put it out there if the law enforcement doesn't want it out there. And again, this is one of those big cases. If you see something, say something, because they don't have her right now. You know, could she still be alive? There's a chance. There's a chance. Uh, I don't, you know... I'm not that optimistic about it, but she could still be alive. Let's let's hope and pray for that, that she's still alive. I would really, really hope and pray that she's still alive. I mean, it's a, she's a beautiful young girl. She's got a family. Uh, just keep that in, in mind. Keep, keep her in your prayers. But uh, you showed the vehicle, Billy. Now, that vehicle is fairly late model. There may be some type of onboard computer or a tracking uh, device. I believe the vehicle was owned by a cleaning company. Now you said there was a woman that gave him possession of the vehicle. So it, hopefully there could be some tracking device to see where that vehicle traveled on Friday morning, you know, during the time uh, post the. Uh, Phil, I think they already have that with the pings from his cell phone. The yeah. Right they, at that scene. Yeah. They, they're going to have that, but uh, a lot of the later model cars, uh, you can activate, uh, you know, stuff within the car through your cell phone. So there might be a way to see exactly the exact route. You know, the pings from the cell phone, you know, if, if, you're, if you're in an area and you, you move to a different area, your cell phone, unless you're using it, will give exact locations. But if it's just pinging, it only gives general locations, which the area could be, you know, could be a pretty wide area, quarter mile, a mile, whatever it is. So I think if there's some type of... Uh, you know, onboard computer that can give exact tracking, that would be very, very important. And it might be able to tell the exact route that that vehicle took with stops and things like that. So again, the onboard computer will tell, uh, I think it'll tell, you know, distance and trips like that. So they'll be able to figure out where that vehicle was. L let's hope anyway. Pez, he didn't do this alone. No way. He grabbed her, smashed her phone and threw the water bottle while her running away. 
he overpowered her. You know, he knew what he was going to do. She didn't. He may have hit her in the head and knocked her out or, caught, or gave her a concussion. We don't know. According to the video, which they haven't shared, this was a violent struggle. Could he? He's a he's jailhouse. He's prison strong, and he just probably overpowered her. So there's no. We don't have any reason to believe that anyone else was in that car right now. It, l listen, it's possible, but uh, you know, I think if they, from the video or the witnesses, that they thought that there was uh, two people in the car, they probably would have announced that there's someone at large. Uh, I, I don't think from what I'm seeing that there is somebody else. It's possible, of course. But, Bill, you you, you made the point that, uh, you know, uh, he was uh, she was overpowered. There was a struggle. It was a violent attack. So, uh, again, he, he might be uh, much bigger than her and, and overpowered her. And uh, they may not have need to have a second person involved. And, again, he could have enlisted some type of a, a weapon you know, a, uh, a stun gun, like we said, or a mace or something. So again, just a, a terrible, terrible attack. And I'm certain that the police are going to figure out exactly what took place. You know, folks, you're saying in the chat that her uh, clothing was uh, recovered in the McDonald's um, parking lot, I don't know, in the dumpster. I didn't have any confirmation of that. So I didn't, re I didn't report that. I didn't have a, a reliable source that said this law enforcement said this or the press said this recovered. The, I don't have that, so I didn't report that. If that is the case, that's uh, extra disturbing. That's even more disturbing. But as I said, I don't have any confirmation that that, in fact, occurred. So I'm not going to put it out there. If someone yeah. can confirm that with, with a source, I would uh, happily report that. But I didn't see that confirmed anywhere. I saw it as sort of Internet chatter. You know, Bill, this case is giving me parallels, as we talked about yesterday, the Katrina Vetrano case. That case, a young woman was jogging, I think it was early afternoon, uh, and she was uh, she was uh, attacked and killed by a, a predator that came out of the came out of the bushes or the woods as she was uh, jogging in a, a desolated area. This is uh, another case, very similar. Only he used a vehicle and she was jogging at four 30 in the morning, probably dark. And uh, you know, uh, we talked about the different things that people who are going to be out jogging should do. Obviously, like we said, we stressed and that's so, so important. And Bill, you brought it up yesterday. You cannot allow yourself to be taken into a vehicle or taken to a secondary location. So, so important. And again, they sell these uh, keychain mace, uh, different things that you can you can use to uh, defend yourself. And again, self defense courses. Uh, everybody that's uh, you know women, men, whatever, everybody should try to uh, you know have some type of self defense training in in there. You know you're going to be out and about. You never know what predator is going to stumble upon you or, or, or try to attack you. So uh, again, those things are very very important. So I want to play a little bit of the family. The family was told last night, and this is the statement they made to um, let's play this here. Uncle of Liza Fletcher. On behalf of Liza's family, no sound. her husband Richie. You got sound. It's low. Mom Adele, her father Beasley, her brother Gil, and all the members of her family. We want to make a brief statement. We want to start by thanking everyone for their prayers and outpouring of support. Liza has touched the hearts of many people, and it shows. We want to thank the Memphis Police Department, Shelby County Sheriff Department, TBI, FBI, and all of the other law enforcement agencies who are working tirelessly to find Liza. The family has met with police, and we have shared with them all the information we know. More than anything, we want to see Liza returned home safely. The family has offered a reward for any information that leads to her safe return. We believe someone knows what happened and can help. If you have any information on this crime or Liza's location, call the police at 901-545-COPS or call Crime Stoppers at 901-528-CASH. Thank you. You know, folks, early on in the investigation, of course the police have to look at the family. You always look at the closest person. You look at the husband. At this point, that doesn't look like that has anything to do with this right now. To me, uh, this looks like 
a random attack. However, he could have been, it could have been, I don't know, he could have been stalking her because she runs the same route every day. He could know of her. Like, what was his motive on, on, uh, behind this attack? Was it money? Was it, was it a sexual assault? We don't know that right now. All we know that this was a violent, violent attack on an innocent jogger. And again, I don't want to hear any victim shaming either. Oh, she shouldn't be running at 430. You should be free to do whatever you want in this country. Is it maybe not wise to do that? I think every jogger, no matter where they are and what time of day, they should run with somebody. Whether you're male, female, you should run with. What if you have a health problem? Anything. Sure. You should have someone there to help you. And in, in, in uh, this type of thing, you should have someone there to protect you. Because if you was with someone else, this guy wouldn't even have tried this. You know, just strength in numbers. Even another female jogger. Strength in numbers to someone like this, uh, this savage, this inmate, this career criminal would not have even tried this. So, you know, again, I'm not trying to shame the victim. Not, not at all. This woman is a beautiful woman. She was totally 1,000% innocent. And this is what we have bad people in this world. And some people don't want to accept that. We have some real bad people out there. And, you know, I don't want to get into the politics of it, but the posture in this country is like to treat prison inmates like they're good people. Give them a second, third, fourth, fifth chance. Instead of putting them in prison, let's give them a diversion program. Let's put them on parole. Let's put them out there with the general population. They already showed that they can't live with the general population being free. Maybe they should be in the general population in prison. They don't belong out of prison because they can't live out of prison because they've shown that already by their acts. Listen, prison is not a deterrent for a guy like this. He probably likes prison. He was in prison for 20 years. He knows the ins and outs. He knows how to play the system. And there are just certain people, unfortunately, that should not be free to roam the streets that need to be incarcerated. This guy obviously fits that pattern. I don't see this as a robbery motive because what could she have had on her? A cell phone? I mean, I don't know. I, 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 I just... It doesn't seem like that's going to be a logical uh, motive for this attack. Um, this animal should not be on the street. Unfortunately, there are certain people that cannot be corrected with, uh, you know, incarceration, uh, reacclimated into society. It's an unfortunate fact, but you're right, Bill. The, the, t the tendency today in society is to, you know, go easy on criminals. And we're, we're going down a very dangerous path when we do that. We have bail reform in New York state that they're letting people out of jail without bail on a lot of different crimes. Some of them violent and, and they're letting them back out there to be rearrested over and over and over again. Society has to face the fact that incarceration is needed in a lot of cases. And there are certain people. And I think this guy qualifies that he should not be allowed to be on the street. Look what he did. And he repeated the same behavior that he was incarcerated for over 20 years ago. Michelle Pranzo, that may be the uh, link to the uh, her clothing that we were looking for. Uh, from the Daily Mail, cops search McDonald's dumpster and hunt for missing Memphis heiress after raiding apartment and apprehending suspect. But we're having people report on here, which I didn't report because I couldn't verify it, that her clothing was found in a McDonald's dumpster. That's still, Rachelle, I don't think that's um, verifying that, but this is maybe this is as close as you can get to. Maybe they had some information that he dumped her in a dumpster, which is horrible to say. But, you know, this is a this is an ugly case. L listen, Bill, if there is something to the search of the McDonald's dumpster where they're going to recover some evidence, that's actually a positive thing. Because there'll probably be video surveillance cameras that they'll be able to pick up who dumped whatever it is that they're looking for, if in fact this is credible information. So again, in the world we live in today, there's so many video cameras, there's so many ring doorbells, traffic cameras, all these different things. And again, his DNA being found at the scene, uh, that's another nail in his coffin, his cell phone triangulating. And then we're going to see if she is found, what evidence can be recovered from her. Uh, so uh, there's still a lot of work to be done, obviously. Uh, I can't commend these uh, law enforcement agencies enough. I mean, they really were on top of this thing 
quickly. When you have DNA evidence recovered and within a day, you're able to track, track down a perpetrator based on that DNA evidence, that's really good police work. Phase 28, blood found in car suggests serious injury. I agree, phase 28. You're 100% right. Emma Chidoro, all he knows is jail and kidnapping. Yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a, what we would call a predator. Absolutely. Uh, Jay Mick, uh, sorry, Bill, I'm sure you wouldn't encourage your wife or daughter to be jogging at 430. You're 100% right. I would not. But I'm not going to tell someone else what they should do with their life. I wouldn't. In fact, I would discourage my wife uh, from running at 430 in the morning. You know? I, I agree with that, Billy. And again, like you said, we don't want to victim shame. Is it a good idea to go d uh, jogging at 4.30 in the morning when it's dark out? Obviously not. But, you know, we do live in a free country or so we're told. Uh, but again, uh, not a good idea. Go with someone if you're going to go out at that time. Uh, go with some type of a weapon, whether it be a mace or some type of a sharp object or a blunt object that you can defend yourself with. And again, uh, it makes more sense to do it around other people, less likely that someone's going to attack you. Mountain Kayaker, thank you for the 499 Super thank Chat. You. I enjoy learning so much from your retired NYPD detectives. Thank you, Mountain Kayaker. You know, I had one thing when I was thinking about this case. When there's a kidnapping and you arrest somebody, um, you really don't have to read the Miranda once you arrest them because there's something called the, the emergency exception to Miranda. And right now we don't know if Eliza is alive and dead. So reading him Miranda wasn't in the cards as far as I was concerned. It was an emergency situation. It's still an emergency situation. It's all academic because he refused to talk. But in these circumstances, when you have a perpetrator and you still have an emergency situation, this would have been an emergency exception to Miranda, and they would not have had to Mirandize him. In case some of you folks don't know what Miranda is, you hear it on TV every minute. You have the right to remain silent. You have a right to and it's all of those things. That's your rights of a person in custody, commonly known as Miranda warnings. Bill, I think the area you're getting into is your constitutional rights, which everyone uh, in America is afforded to. However, there wouldn't be any kind of a legal ramification where something that uh, some information that they got from him would be thrown out later in court because of the emergency exception. I think that's a great point that you brought up, Billy. When you have a kidnapping and, uh, you know, when there's a ransom and different things like that, that ex uh, emergency exception rule comes into play where you want to locate a person that could be uh, someplace where they're in grave danger, uh, and you want to, you know, get the information so you can, uh, save them and keep them alive. So again, the fact that she was re reported as abducted 100%, we knew she was kidnapped and abducted. The emergency exception clause would definitely fall into, uh, once they, uh, located this gentleman and they, uh, I shouldn't call him a gentleman, this low life once they got him and, uh, they wouldn't have to read him his rights as far as, uh, you know, trying to get information out of him hundred percent, Billy. Uh, L U G. She is a hardcore runner. She runs marathons. It's not unusual that she was out running at that time. No, that was the time she ran because she wanted to do it before work. She wanted to do it before her kids got up and she'd have to give them breakfast, send them on their way to school or whatever, nursery school. Then she would go to work. So, you know, she has every God-given right to run at 4.30 in the morning. We're just quest questioning the wisdom of it, the fact that she would be alone and it would be dark out. And she felt, I'm sure she felt that the course that she was running was safe. She's running on the University of Memphis campus. Probably There's probably the security patrols as well as lighting and cameras and all of that. However, that didn't stop this animal. But uh, again, Bill, you're making a great point. Yeah, she she probably wanted to, you know, she's a school teacher. She wanted to get it done before work, obviously. And like you said, get the kids ready for school, get them breakfast or whatever. So we're not going to knock her for that. Was it a wise thing? Obviously, a, a wiser choice would have been to do it, you know, during the middle of the day when there was a lot of other people. But maybe she doesn't like to run in, in a crowded area, too. So who knows? But uh, again, uh, it's just, it's, it's a terrible thing. I mean, we should be allowed to go out and move about on our own without being attacked, you know, jogging. So. Mo Dean, people try to get away with things because cops didn't read them their Miranda rights, but that barely happens when they do get off over that. Mo Dean, I'm citing a special circumstance when the police do not have to read Miranda. And that is 
called the emergency exception to Miranda. And this is one of those instances where there would have been, or there is an emergency exception to Miranda. Once the emergency is over, then you must read the Miranda. But when the emergency still exists, they do not have to. Same thing with a search warrant. They probably could have went into his home, but I, I, don't, I don't know if he had his own home without a search warrant to see if she was there because it's an emergency exception to a search warrant also, looking for a kidnapped victim. You don't have to get a search warrant because the law recognizes that this person could still be alive and spending time uh, applying for a warrant could make sure this person isn't alive. She could die. So that's why there's an, also an emergency exception to a search warrant. Billy, you're making such a really good point, and I want to expand on it a little bit. Perhaps let's just say he comes out of his house and he locks the door behind him and the police are waiting for him. They've identified that he's the one that uh, apprehended her and kidnapped her. They don't need a warrant to knock down that door and go in and look for her. Like you said, the emergency exception clause would be right on target because of the fact in a normal case, if they wanted to go in and recover evidence or look for evidence uh, in a situation where there was an emergency where a person's life was at stake, they would have to get a warrant. But in that case, they could break down the door, go right in and look because it's, it's kind of logical that he's coming out of a location. He's the one that's been identified as the person that kidnapped her, that she might be within that home. So again, that, that uh, real good point, Bill. I'll just play a little bit of this here here at 728 on the East Coast. I do want to get you back to this breaking news that we are following here. The Memphis Police Department in Tennessee says that they have arrested a man in connection with the kidnapping of a missing teacher. She is Eliza Fletcher, seen right there on your screen. Cleotha Abston, 38 years old, has been arrested and charged with especially aggravated kidnapping and evidence tampering following Fletcher's mysterious disappearance on Friday. The investigation into that abduction of Eliza Fletcher is still active and ongoing, according to police, and investigators are continuing the search and following all leads because they have made this arrest but have still not found Fletcher. Fletcher was out on a routine early morning run near the University of Memphis Friday when she was abducted and forced into a dark SUV that is coming from police there. They did identify the vehicle and are continuing to search for Fletcher. We do know that late Saturday, Memphis police said the vehicle had been located, though the Memphis kindergarten teacher and 34-year-old mom still not Found. They did hold a news conference yesterday to update the situation. We are working to get some of that sound here so we can bring that to you. But we know that another man was arrested Sunday, though the arrest not in connection with her kidnapping. We are working to get more details on that as well. Again, the search still underway, and we do know that the family is offering a $50,000 reward for anyone with information on her whereabouts. If you are just Folks, uh, Aaron, warrant shows, thank you, Aaron, for this information. Warrant shows he was seen in video tracking and following her for several minutes before he did take her, then stayed in parking lot for four minutes before he left with her. That's very disturbing to me, extremely disturbing. And uh, if it's not disturbing to you folks in the uh, chat, you know, uh, police personnel like us with our experience that's disturbing. And the fact that he was sort of tracking her and stalking her, that 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 is really disturbing also. Absolutely, Bill. There's a, a person in the chat said this, and I think this is important to read. Uh, priority pieces. I live in Las Vegas and running at that time is very normal as it gets too hot. Otherwise, I pray for her safety. JC also says here in the UK, it's common for runners to go jogging at approximately 5 a.m. when the streets are quiet, as there are few vehicles to worry about when crossing roads quickly. Obviously, two very good points. Uh, trying to beat the heat, you go out early in the morning. And if you're in an area where there's a lot of cars, you don't have to dodge cars. So doing it at that time. 
Uh, I used to be a jogger myself. Uh, I would go to a track and jog and stuff like that. I didn't jog through the streets, but people that do do that, I can understand not trying to make excuses for anything. Like we said, was it a wise decision? Obviously not, but, uh, there is other reasons other than the fact that, you know, she wanted to go out for uh, a jog. She had uh, perhaps the reasons noted, maybe it was too warm, doesn't want to, uh, dodge vehicles. So again, those are just, uh, things to consider. Laura Bright, nobody has called about a ransom, so I don't think this was a kidnapping for ransom. I agree with you, Laura. You know, like it. the FBI and the ATF and the local police, um, they're going to put this all together. Uh, I'm amazed and impressed at what a great job they've done thus far. I cannot believe how quickly the DNA came back. It was probably less than 24 hours. They lifted DNA off his sandals, and it came back and identified him. That didn't happen during my career. Uh, during my police career, it would take two to three months for the DNA to come back. And I know you guys have watched Barbara Butcher on uh, Duty Rod show. She said that 9-11 um, increased the technology for DNA by three generations. So good things came out of a horrendous day, 9-11 that the DNA technology was advanced by three generations due to that attack because they had to come up with new techniques to help identify people. But I'm so amazed that they were able to lift DNA off this guy's sandals and identify him in less than 24 hours. That, that is incredible. Absolutely incredible, Billy. And also, also, that cell phone technology they got quickly. They said they were able to ping his phone in and around the area of where the kidnapping and, and the abduction took place. So again, that's another thing that usually takes, I mean, you would think it takes a couple of days at least and an hour time on the job. It used to take much longer, a couple of weeks, but they got that very quickly. Again, the emergency exception to the fact that we, you know, they must've gone to the phone company and say, look, uh, we're trying to find a person that could still be alive. And uh, you know, we need this information uh, sooner rather than later. So again, those two things, uh, the DNA match into the database. They lifted DNA. They were able to put it into uh, a computer and and get it into the database. And they got a quick match on the perpetrator. Great work. And then the cell phone technology. Those two things are really really strong. And you know when you work in a case and you're building and you have these things, if you get to the point where you do need a search warrant for something, you're going to present these facts to the district attorney or whoever it is that's going to be writing out the. Uh, search warrant for you. And when you go to the judge, you know, these things are, are, are scrutinized. So when you have these kind of uh, pieces of evidence and information, it helps to uh, sustain the, uh, you know, the search warrants. Folks, this is Police Off the Cuff, Real Crime Stories. If you're not subscribed to us, please go on our YouTube. It's free. Hit the subscribe button. Give us a thumbs up. Ring that bell. If you like real crime from a police perspective, and from the experiences of a 27 and a 22-year NYPD veteran that had almost all their time on the NYPD was doing investigations like these, then, then you're in the right place. And if you'd like to support us, we have a Patreon with three different levels. And if you see the folks in our chat that are in, have the green font, they're part of our YouTube memberships, and we really appreciate them, and they support Police Off the Cuff. We've just inched over 31,000 uh subscribers and um is it 31 or 30 i'm, I'm, I'm getting confused we're, we're, we're over thirty one thousand, billy or over thirty one thousand. it went so, so we, quick that you, you didn't yeah realize. we're starting to grow and i really appreciate all the new folks and people from england and ireland and australia and south africa it's really it's so heartwarming to see these people from other companies join uh, co co companies countries countries joining us and becoming part of the police off the cuff real crime stories family it, it really makes my heart warm and, and i thank all you guys that support us these type of cases you know i almost feel like i'm back on the job because it hurts a case like this hurts and these are the type of cases that cops with boots on the ground this is what causes ptsd these type of cases you, you, you feel for these people. You feel for this family. And, you know, I, I know the other day we were coming out with, oh, they got to look at the family. They got to look at the husband. That's investigation 101. And you may find that harsh 
but you have to eliminate things and then move on to where the the evidence takes you. And that's what the police did. The police in this instance have done an unbelievable job, not just good, unbelievable. So everyone out, a lot of people out there like to bash the police. Let's praise them when they do an unbelievable job like this. 100% Billy. And listen, like you said, it's police work 101. And when you have a situation like this, the family wants to put everything out there and, you know, get everything out in front and look at it. And, you know, so that way the attention and the focus and the uh, resources can, you know, look for the real reason that this woman was abducted. So again, uh, cooperation from the family obviously was uh, done in this case. Uh, we had that feeling because of the fact what we saw that they were recovering her laptop and they were taking a vehicle from the scene. So again, uh, we're just glad that the police did such a fantastic job on this case. They really need to be applauded and uh, it's good police work all around. As far as I'm concerned, I mean, really super uh, again, let's just, let's keep our fingers crossed that maybe she's still alive. Crazy nurse 2.0 bill. Do you think it's because they're prominent? I think that could, you know, uh, have something to do with it, that they got the FBI and the ATF right off the bat. They were working with the Memphis police, um, the campus security, the campus police. They were all on board. This was a case right in the middle of the city that upsets people. So is there politics to this? A lot of times anything happens on a college campus, they want it solved yesterday, you know, because there is so many, there's kids, there's so much politics on a college campus, but you know, I, I don't want to go into the politics of this. The police did an unbelievable job. Uh, was she from a prominent family? Yes. But was she a, a real victim that was out minding her own business, just jogging at 4.30 in the morning? Does she deserve to be kidnapped off the street? Shouldn't we give that, you know, a full court press from minute one until we solve it? I, I believe so. Bill, I got to tell you that I was never... Uh, 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 you know, jaded towards uh, helping somebody because of their prominence in the community. Didn't matter to me. I looked at a victim as a victim. Every victim was the same in my eyes. If it was a young woman that was out jogging, I don't care who she came from, where she came from. She could have lived in the projects. Uh, even, you know, we've, we've solved cases where people that probably did a lot of bad things, but they were killed in the drug game or whatever. We still investigated to get justice for that person and the family, because that's what we do. And in a case like this, yeah, phone calls could have been made from a prominent family. Listen, you know, try and give some help. Uh, you know, my, whatever is missing, whatever relative it was or friend, uh, of course, things like that are going to happen. That's politics. But me as an investigator, I'm sure, Bill, you feel the same way. And most law enforcement offices, they don't look at the color, the race, the prominence of the victim. The victim is the victim. You're there. You are you're you have a calling to be a police officer, law enforcement officer. You do the job based on what's in front of you. And that victim, I helped every victim the same in my eyes. Everybody was the same. You know, I didn't care about uh, color, race or anything like that or creed or where you came from. You're a victim. I'm there to help you. Aaron, Warren showed DNA that linked him before crime, during, and after. So the during, obvious concerns me for sexual assault. I'm not liking the likely outcome. You know, he was obviously, because of his 20 years in prison, he was obviously in the DNA database. So once they got a, a DNA exemplar to compare it against the database, they got a hit within less than 24 hours. To me... That's amazing. I never have seen that speed of having DNA return. And also comparing it against the database used to take longer than an actual exemplar, uh, comparing an exemplar against even a local database. So uh, I don't know how they did it, how they got it back so quickly, but thank God they did. You know, Bill, I'm going to read into some of this stuff that was reported and if you look at what they're saying based on the video information, I think they've deducted and they've uh, made a, uh, you know, a, a decision or their opinion that she was probably bleeding after the attack. That's what I'm looking at, reading into it a little bit. Uh, they're saying that based on the violent attack, there appears to have been blood evidence inside the vehicle. So, you know, from watching it, you can see 
what took place. And I, I hate to even describe this. I, I, it's a sensitive area to, you know, to talk about uh, someone's assault, but they probably were able to deduct that she was bleeding from what they saw on the video of the attack and the witness, they said witness testimony. So there could be someone that observed it again. Uh, these are factors that we can't close our eyes to them. They're there. We have to investigate them. And that's probably how they came out with the special circumstance charge based on the fact that they believe she was violently attacked and probably suffered grave injuries. So uh, it is what it is. It's an unfortunate thing. I hate to even, it troubles me to even talk about it, but these are the facts. Folks, these are the kind of cases that you want to, celebrate law enforcement for being the professionals they are and to be able to put a case like this together so they they can put away a a human predator like this guy who you see on the screen you know this guy does not belong to live in the free world you know he belongs in a little uh nine foot by five foot cell for the rest of his life you know and he shouldn't even have been out period this guy and um you know, as I said, you want to applaud law enforcement for their professionalism, for the job that they do to put away when something like this happens, to put away a predator like this and make sure he never gets out. Bill, I got to tell you, that guy, that scumbag deserves the electric chair. I, I really believe in capital punishment in situations like this. Uh, he, he, I had to look away from the camera, Mike, cause my blood pressure was starting to boil. I just want to reach through the screen and, and choke him, but we'll save that for another discussion. Yo, main girl. Thank you for the $5 super chat. I believe PD in the U S need our support now more than ever. Thank Yo, you. Yo, main girl. Thank you so much. And I agree with you. You know, the, law enforcement as a profession took such a hit after the, uh, you know, the, the whole defund the police movement. George and Floyd. Hopefully that craziness is getting out, and now they're going to fund the police and make it and support it as the profession that it is. And uh, thank you, Yo Main Girl. It's very nice of you. Um, it's, you know, as I said, these are the type of cases that stay with you, that, uh, that give you PTSD. Phil, I just want to go to a quick commercial for Joe Murray. Sure. Joe Murray, attorney at law. Have you found yourself in a jam? Are you in need of legal counsel in the New York area? Do you need a victim's advocate? Well, Joe Murray is your man. He's not only an experienced trial attorney. He's also a retired 15 year member of the NYPD. He literally knows both sides of defense. His website is jmurray-law.com. His telephone number is 646-838-1702. Or you can email Joe at joe at jmurray-law.com. And if you would like to advertise on Police Off the Cuff Real Crime Stories, just send us an email at policeoffthecuff, the number one, at gmail.com. That's policeoffthecuff, one word, number one, at gmail.com. Our rates are very reasonable, and we have a national as well as an international audience. It could be the right thing for your business. Folks, on 9-10-2022, uh, there's a First Responders Unite for Fight Night. And it's a benefit for the Tunnel to the Towers, which is a 9-11 uh, charity. New York City Cops and Kids, NYPD Boxing, FDNY Boxing, National Grid, Department of Sanitation, New York, Department of Corrections, Customs, USMC Boxing, uh, Staten Island University Community Park in Staten Island. That's where this is going to take place. 75 Richmond Terrace, Staten Island, New York. So it's a great night of boxing. Uh you know, and it's a charity that will benefit um, uh, Tunnels to Towers. So we'd appreciate if you'd support that. So, guys, you know, what do we, what do the police do now? What are, what are we doing now? And there's, there's a lot more investigation to do. You know, I know it's, it's cliche, yeah, cross your T's, dot your eyes, but they really do have to do that. They have to do more work on his cell phone more work on the vehicle, where was the vehicle. And of course, there's probably going to be searches all over the community. And hopefully they'll get some tips and following up on tips because this is not an easy case to solve. Now they got the guy, how they got the guy that fast? Exemplary, exemplary police work. Outstanding. I can't say it enough. Uh, the Memphis police, the FBI, the ATF, 
brilliant, brilliant job. And let's just hope that they, Eliza is recovered and alive. Um, this is a horrible, horrible case. We reiterated it a million times. The evidence inside that vehicle shows that something really heinous occurred during this kidnapping. Billy, you know, the, uh, the work of the investigators is clearly not over. Uh, if they do get information on, we, talk, we talked a little bit about possibly uh, recovering some evidence in a McDonald's or a dumpster, something like that. You're going to want to, you know, when you go into court, you have a very high threshold that you have to reach with evidence. Uh, the, the term is it has to be believable beyond the reasonable doubt. That means that it has to, a very high threshold when you're putting forth, you're charging someone with uh, whether it be kidnapping, murder, whatever the case is going to be, sexual crimes. Uh, there's a very high threshold in the United States. Our criminal justice system says that, you know, you have to, uh, the jury has to be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt. So that's why when they do recover a piece of evidence, they want to say conclusively that it's, linked to the person who's being charged. So they'll look for video evidence. They'll do search warrants on that vehicle. Uh, they'll do crime scene in investigation on that vehicle to perhaps recover DNA, blood, things of that nature. They may go into his home to see if anything, a lot of times predators will take a souvenir, so to speak. They'll take something that belonged to that victim. So again, all of these things are probably being done as we speak. And again, Billy, like you said, this was a real quick, wrap up to finding this perpetrator. Uh, now we just need to locate uh, the victim in this case, Eliza. And uh, like you said, hopefully she's still alive. Waitress for Jesus. Did he have injuries? Very, very good point. Yep. Excellent point. Uh, if I would imagine he does. The police did not release any of that information. Many times in these instances, uh, he could suffer some injuries from the a victim fighting back and scratched or whatever. And, uh, you know, they would definitely photograph his body, uh, you know, take samples from those injuries with the potential that the victim's DNA could be inside those injuries. Exactly. And uh, all of those things I'm sure are done, but waitress for Jesus, thank you for bringing that up. That's uh, a very important point. You know, when and if uh, Eliza is recovered, uh, there could also be, uh, DNA from the perpetrator on on her. So again, uh, you know, there's that touch DNA that we talk about. Uh, there's other forms of DNA that could be, you know, if he was injured, is his blood on her body? Uh, bodily fluids is, is always something that uh, is considered in, uh, you know, crime scene investigation. So again, all of those things, that'll just be more and more evidence connecting uh, the perpetrator to the victim. Uh, Paula Williams, is it possible the husband and or nanny hired this man? I, we have no information or any evidence. Anything is possible. Uh, I haven't, uh, read anything or had any reason to think now based on what we know that the husband was involved in this. Yeah, um, that seems rather unlikely. I mean, you know, we have a guy who has an extensive criminal record as a juvenile and then is put away for over 20 years for the similar type thing, abducting someone. And uh, so, I, I mean, you know, is it possible? Yeah, anything's possible, as we always say. But likelihood is not very high at this point that the husband or nanny is involved. Sweet Caroline, this is uh, Memphis, Tennessee. Is this the city and state that this occurred in? So you also have in Tennessee have something called the TBI, the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. So they're also working on this with the FBI, the ATF, and the local Memphis police. And as we said, and I'll repeat it again because it bears repeating, the police did an unbelievable job on this case. I mean, just we need to recover Eliza, hopefully alive. But to make an arrest this quickly, you know that they know what they were doing. They used they used technology too. They didn't just you know uh, just old fashioned gumshoe police work. They used science. They used technology get to get this guy identified. And thank God, technology gives us the, us the leg up on these bad guys because they had the advantage before this. But DNA is a godsend. He's, uh, cell phone technology is a godsend. GPS is a godsend. Video cameras and video, doorbell video, it's a godsend. 
and it's helping us identify these predators. And as I said, look how fast they made an arrest in this case. Billy, you're making really uh, a point that I just want to expand on. I mean, people don't realize from the inside, as an investigator, as a, de a detective, if you get assigned to this case, you you really, we used to call it a bag of shit. You get a bag of shit case where, you know, someone is abducted off the street. There's not a lot of, uh, you know, eyewitness at 430 in the morning. So again, they enlisted every tool that they had. And they were very, very quick on this. And I think that it's not, you're not saying it ad nauseum for no reason. This is really, really good police work. And those guys, they really do need a tip of the hat and a salute, uh, you know, that was really, really good. And, you know, we're coming from the inside and we're thinking about it in our time and, and you know, being uh, challenged with such a case and to have such a, a quick uh, turnaround on it as far as, you know, bringing someone into custody within a day or so, uh, really good police work. Aaron, the Warren also says he was seen cleaning his car with floor cleaner. Another witness stated he was seen washing his clothing and, uh, and agreed he was acting weird around seven to eight. So she is within one and a half hours. Uh, you know, the police are gonna try to put together a timeline based on electronic evidence and where the call was and GPS evidence. And hopefully with that information, with that science, they'll be able to find out where uh, where Eliza is. And uh, how you know, Bill, in this case? If, if you have to think about it like this, if this thing takes place at 4.30 in the morning, maybe he's got to return this car to someone and he probably had to clean it uh, if there was blood inside the vehicle to return it back to that person. He didn't want it there. And again, uh, if you know that you did some horrible crime and there is evidence in the vehicle, you're going to want to get rid of it as soon as possible, even if he wasn't going to give it back. So him washing the vehicle, that's another uh, piece of evidence that's going to you know, be presented at some time in court to a jury to, uh, you know, to get to a point where they can say beyond a reasonable doubt that they believe he's the one that's responsible for this crime and crime and he's guilty of the charges that they're going to put forward. We're getting a little ahead, but I think that uh, all of those things are very, very important and they all lead and point towards this perpetrator. I'm Ochidoro. I, that name, I, I always stumble upon it. I still say kidnapping for ransom and was caught before you could put the whole plan in action. She could be stashed away somewhere. I think though with a kidnapping for um, ransom, it would have, they would have tried not to be as violent as he was during this incident. So that's why I'm sort of, and I, look, I, again, I always make an addendum. I could be wrong in any and all of my predictions, but that's, I'm seeing this as a crime of passion and violence. And it's not seeming to me that it was going to be a kidnapping for money, even despite who she is. And I just think this was a, uh, he was probably, he may have been stalking her, but uh, I think it's going to be a violent crime. Yeah. If you were going to do a kidnapping for a ransom, uh, it would probably would not be as violent as what they're describing in this, uh, you know, this charging document. So again, uh, is it possible? Yeah, of course, anything's possible, but uh, it's highly unlikely at this point, in my opinion. Leanne, did this predator really think he would get away with this? I don't think they consider that. I think right, that's, right. I don't they even think they that. worry about that. They just are so empowered over the urge to do this that they don't think about getting away. I think I'm going to pick up some bear spray more effective than pepper spray. I would think it is, but hopefully you won't spray the wrong person. <laughs> Billy, you got to look at this guy's history. He did 20 years in jail. Jail is not a deterrent for somebody like him. He he's he's okay with jail. He lived there for 20 years. He knows how to play the system. And you know, again, uh, you're not th he's not thinking that at the moment. He's thinking about whatever you know he wants to accomplish with this young woman. He's not thinking about getting caught. And that's why they make mistakes. And that's why they do get caught because if they really thought it out in great detail, they would probably not do and commit all the mistakes that they make, which would make law enforcement's job a lot harder. But again, uh, yeah, I don't think he was thinking about if I'm going to get caught or not. He was thinking about what he wanted to do. Yo, main girl, thank you for the $2 super chat. I behind, they found the person. I believe, yeah, you're right. I think they... 
they got the guy that they were looking for, no doubt. Lieutenant Peter Pranzo, law enforcement, well done. Thank you, Lieutenant Pete. I know Respect, that you, Lieutenant Pete. you've apprehended many of these predators in your police career. Uh, that's Lieutenant Pete Harlem Raiders, great guy. Richella Pranzo is his wife that's also in the chat. Um, Karen Kennedy said that we live in, uh, said the world we live in now. Women are not safe out alone, vulnerable. Sounds so fun to be running that early, and she probably loved it. Angry that she was let out to do it, that he was let out to do it again. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, Aaron, what's you, you're saying now? I need to correct. I did not see one, but what was stated when suspect appeared with date, time, et cetera. I did not see what that was labeled or called. I'm not sure what you're referencing, Aaron. Um, listen, we're going to stay on this case. Uh, till it's till they recover. Oh my God! I hate till they recover Eliza. We're going to stay on this case, and hopefully she'll be recovered alive, and we'll pray for that. Uh, she's got a whole congregation at the church she belongs to that's praying for her now. She's got a family that's praying for her. She's got a lot of people that love her, and all you people in the chat, say prayers for Eliza. You know. Uh, it doesn't get any worse than this. It really doesn't. It is is the worst it could possibly be. And uh, we carry these scars with us from our police careers. And Lieutenant Pete could tell you that. Phil, Detective Phil here. And I can tell you that. We carry these scars. We have cases like this that we carry with us for the rest of our lives. Any law enforcement officer that tells you it doesn't uh, stay with them or affect them is not telling you the truth. Uh, we just uh, are able to deal with it. Uh, every uh, person has a different way with dealing with things. And uh, I'm just glad that the right people were there for Eliza to get this scumbag and, and put him where he belongs. And let's hope and pray that, uh, like we uh, like Bill said, that she's found alive and recovered, uh, you know, and uh, probably needs some medical attention if she is alive. So uh, let's just hope and pray that that takes place. David Boucher, um, as far as I know, he's not on the sex offender list, but he is a parolee. So he's on parole. He's a violent offender. His juvenile record supposedly was off the charts. Violence, you know, robberies, all of that stuff. And then in tw tw uh, the year 2000, he kidnapped an attorney at gunpoint, threw him in the trunk of his car, forced him to withdraw money from his ATM. And for that, he served 20 years. He was supposed to do 24. He got out in, 2000, in uh, 2020. So he should still be in prison. You know, Bill, uh, that's really actually a good point that's brought up. It, usually, uh, most cases like this, uh, you're going to query parolees and sex offender. You're going to go to the sex offender registry to see who is in that area where the crime takes place. Same thing with parolees. And uh, parolees, when you're on parole, you don't have civil rights. Parole officers can enter into your residence without a warrant, uh, search through your belongings, uh, and obviously uh, try to garner information. So, again, those are the things that we do do in, in a lot of cases. We'll query uh, parolees and we'll go into the sex offender registry and see who's on that registry in the area and go talk with them. Michelle, uh, to answer your question, yes, your DNA will be on your gum. I'll just cut right to the chase. Uh, saliva DNA stays in gum. That's why sometimes they'll surreptitiously try to collect DNA for someone. If they throw out gum, they'll collect the gum and try to get the DNA off of that. You know, so yes, it does. Stay there, there was a case, I believe it was out in the 114, a Queens case years ago where a perpetrator was accused of a rape. He had come in for questioning. And then uh, when he left the precinct, he spit on the floor. Uh, he, he, they didn't have enough to hold him. They took the, the, the spit, uh, they collected it. They did a DNA uh, match, uh, it matched the, uh, perpetrator, uh, you know, to the victim and they were able to arrest him. So yeah, DNA is a uh, great technology that's been developed over the years. Unbelievable. Yeah, I'll tell a real quick story from France. This stick up team goes to this jewelry store and they, there's two or three of them. They stick up the jewelry store and they the refuse to open up the safe. So the guy goes, you open up the safe, I'm going to shoot you. So the woman opens up the safe. They take all the jewels. Before he leaves, he kisses her on the cheek. She didn't touch her face. They swabbed the face and got the DNA of the stick-up guy, and that's how they caught him. Yeah, so, yeah, that's, so that's Yeah. 
Great another, technology. Another brilliant case of technology. Oh, guys, you know, we're at a, an hour and nine minutes. We only intended to do an hour, but this case is amazing. As I said, we'll come back uh, and redo this case. Uh, we'll stay with it until we have, oh, my God, either Eliza found alive or whatever the finality of this case is. But thank you so much for um, tuning in. Phil, final words. Final words. Again, I'm going to echo what you said, Billy. Uh, have a good thought for this woman and her family. Say a prayer. Let's hope that she is still alive and recovered. And anything that takes place going forward with regard to this case, we're going to be right on it. Um, these cases are very interesting, but they are really heart wrenching and, uh, they tug at your, uh, your emotions, but as professionals, we're able to, uh, talk about it and give an idea of what we think is going on. Again, we were in a different, uh, place with this case yesterday. We've now switch gears based on uh, all the things that took place in the last 24 hours. But uh, let's get justice for Eliza and let's hope that she's found safe and sound. Guys, thanks for listening. God bless prayers for Eliza Fletcher and for her family. Stay safe, everyone. One episode, just ain't enough.